Hi, this is Brian Forster of Hidden Inca Tours, and today we're going to an extremely bizarre location. And it's chronicled in my new book, Lost Ancient Technology of Egypt, Volume 2. Now this strange location is called Tanis, and it's in the Nile Delta in northern Egypt. It takes three and a half hours to drive from Cairo, and for the last two hours we drive through lush vegetation and agricult uh, agricultural farmland. So this, the question is, why is Tanis seemingly devoid of life, and why is every sculpture and obelisk and pillar, etc., smashed to pieces? This is way beyond the damage of any marauding army or vandalism. This is cataclysmic destruction, and we're going to see lots of evidence of heat scorching on the surfaces of a lot of the stone. Now most of the stone, which is located at Tanis, such as this, is granite, and it's likely that the granite came from the great uh, quarry at Aswan, and Aswan is a thousand kilometers to the south. So how was all of this transported? These are small pieces. Again, notice the very strange erosion of the surfaces. And the only piece that seems to have been intact is this quartzite box. The hieroglyphics were likely done by the dynastic Egyptians, but it's clear that the dynastic Egyptians found the site of Tanis in complete destruction, and so they decided to build there and recycle with what they found. Now again, is this erosion natural or normal, or could it be the result of intense blasts of heat? This gives you the visual. Again, you can see that Tanis is more or less devoid of life, except for the odd thorny bush, like the one you can see on the right here. And when you walk on the surface, it's not like you're walking in sand or on dirt, but more like flour, as if all of the nutrients was burnt out of the soil itself. And this gives you an idea of the sheer volume of stone found at Tanis. Again, likely from the Aswan granite quarry, a thousand kilometers to the south. And as you can see, every single stone shows incredible levels of damage. Archaeologists tried to put this sculpture together, but it does look like some of the extensions of it, like the arms, were literally blown off. This fits in well with the theory of Dr. Robert Schock regarding solar plasma striking the Earth 12,000 years ago. And this is another example. You can see that the right-hand side of that statue has been hit with at least 2,000 degrees Celsius of heat. Now, all of this stone was found by archaeologists in the 19th century underground. They had to dig down 10 to 20 feet in order to find Tanis. And here you can see that this wall section, in fact, was probably rebuilt by the dynastic Egyptians, possibly two or three or four thousand years ago. And look at that slab of granite on the left where Irene is standing. Massive. So this area may have been exposed during dynastic times, and they built that wall section. There are also an incredible number of obelisks and sections of obelisks located in Tanis, more than at any other location by far in Egypt. This would not have been a place where obelisks were manufactured, because again, the quarry is a thousand kilometers away. So they would have been made at Aswan and then transported to different locations around Egypt. But also what we know is that the obelisks themselves are megalithic and they were constructed in pre-dynastic times by a civilization that clearly had lost ancient high technology because the Bronze Age dynastic people could not shape granite surfaces like this. 
They could etch in hieroglyphics, but they couldn't shape sculptures like this. Now here again, the bottom of the statue, we're seeing intense heat. This has been corroborated by geologists that we've had on location. And again, it looks like sections of that statue were blown off, not struck off. Here's another statue. You see the left-hand side has been melted. These uh, sculptors would have made sure that the stone was very consistent and homogeneous before they started the sculpture, so it's not a flaw in the stone. It's a heat effect that happened to the stone in the very distant past. Again, a massive block of stone, at least 20 tons. Surface erosion is excessive. And just everything is broken on a massive scale. Vandals with hammers could not do this kind of damage. This had to have been done by some sort of natural external force that literally blew Tanis to pieces. And we also see evidence of this at other locations such as Karnak and the Ramesseum and other locations to the south. But it's here. Look, another obelisk section on the left. And the fineness and depth of this carving, again, appears to be machined, not done by hand. So we're looking at the possibility that even hieroglyphics are older than the dynastic Egyptians. When you look into the background, that is the original level that archaeologists found in this area. So they had to dig down in order to expose all of the stone. Again, look at the blackness on that stone on the right. That appears to be heat. So this is an overview of Tanis, or at least this is what we were allowed to see. It's in the middle of an army slash police base, and we were only allowed to see a certain section of it. If I started to wander off and look at other areas, I was immediately told to come back. And so why they're being so secretive here is a very good question. Again, devastating damage. The stone is strewn all over the place. This is not a civilization moving in and taking over and deciding to destroy ancient structures. There's another obelisk you see in the background with Yusuf Awian. Another obelisk section and then another obelisk section. There are between 10 and 20, if not more, obelisks that were found in the area, all broken. And again, this surface appears to be machined, not done with chisels. So that is lost ancient high technology evidence. Another section of an obelisk with very deep carving into the granite surface. And of course, the, um, the stone has been lined up during the excavation times by the archaeologists. Here you see more sections of obelisks. And the new prevailing theory is that the obelisks were originally made not as standing monuments for the glorification of the ancient Egyptian rulers, but in fact they were part of an energetic system. They were the receivers of energy emitted from the power plants or energy structures that we call the pyramids located around the Giza Plateau area. There's a perfect circular hole that could have been machined. And then we get to the tomb area. And if you look carefully, you can see that all of this stone was restacked during dynastic times. The giant blocks of granite were likely there originally. And then the dynastic people simply took stone from the area, especially this limestone on the left, and piled it up to create a tomb. Inside this one, we find a granite box. This likely was a sarcophagus. The rough, uh, roughness of the surface shows that it was probably done during dynastic times because it's not that well done as compared to the finer craftsmanship of the older megalithic work. And then when we look up, we'll see that this top block has hieroglyphics on it. So clearly, that was recycled from an older structure. The dynastic Egyptians did not move any material in terms of stone into the area. 
They simply recycled what they found, and their technical prowess was not much compared to that of the earlier lost ancient high technology civilization. Here again, we see a much larger box, which they would call a sarcophagus, with the top snapped off as if it was hit with an enormous force. And one last wander through the area of Tanis we were allowed to see, which was quite extensive. And again, you can tell this area was probably exposed and opened during dynastic times, and the stone was reconstructed, or the wall was reconstructed by the dynastic people. See the very poor work on the left-hand side. That's an addition during dynastic times. And the simple fact that this whole area here is devoid of life except for a handful of prickly bushes gives us a strong indication that solar plasma struck this area about 12,000 years ago. This is corroborated by Dr. Robert Schock, who's a geologist and also accounted in my book, Aftershock. Here again, we see more melted surface on this piece of quartzite. It is like a giant came in and just knocked everything to pieces, but it wasn't a giant. It was a giant force that came from outside of the Earth Plasma ejection from the sun, most likely striking at sunrise around 12,000 years ago. It could have been a series of events, not just one simple one-day event, but it could have taken uh, place over the course of up to 300 years, according to Dr. Robert Schock, that would have vaporized anything and anyone that was in this area. The um, soil might have been blown up into the sky and then came down and covered the whole site because here I am on the original surface level. This is the surface that the archaeologists found and in order to see the artifacts you have to climb down again between 10 and 20 feet. And these mysterious men in black see, uh, were with us. There were four or five of them. Very nice suits, sunglasses, um, automatic weapon hiding underneath his jacket. They were keeping a very fine eye on our activity, but thankfully we were able to film. So these are related books of mine at Amazon.com. Lost Ancient Technology of Egypt, Volume 1, which does not include Tanis. Lost Ancient Technology of Egypt, Volume 2, does include a thorough chapter on the Tanis location. Aftershock, the ancient cataclysm that erased human history. And Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh, the only person who lived during dynastic times that fascinates me.